artist or an author use their work to deliver a message, like a political message or social or something like that? And can you think of an example? Um, Fergan, hello. Yes. Hi. <laughs> so. Hey, wow. What? Okay. Uh, maybe the artist can search some symbols and mm, what else? Some different messages inside mm -hmm. uh, of his. Yeah. Are you okay? <laughs> Sorry, that was an echo. <laughs> I thought you started talking and I just stopped. Okay. <laughs> I just woke up and I, I don't know, I can't. Can you, yeah, can you skip to Louise and then I can uh, pull together and start talking? Okay. I'll give you a couple minutes to pull it together. <laughs> um, hey, Louisa. Hey. So what do you think? How might an artist or an author use their work to deliver a message? I think they can draw uh, a situation about what they want to say or if it's kind of po uh, political issue, maybe they uh, wouldn't use it uh, in right. Yeah, I mean, they uh, will use another uh, another thing, but uh, like to draw something else, but we should understand something. Yeah, can you understand that? Yeah, <laughs> so they, they're drawing something, but there's, all, there's a deeper meaning, right? Yeah. That, that they want us to understand. Um, yeah. Have you heard of? Oh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Oh no. Um, allusion. No, I can't think of the word. But there's a word for that <laughs> where things are multi-layered and um, they're kind of showing us something on top, but there's much more going on underneath. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. Can you think of an example? Of an example. Um. <laughs> Were you in our our street art class yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, an example from that. Do you remember? I left early, but oh, okay. We were talking about Banksy, right? Yeah. Uh, and Banksy definitely uses his work to deliver messages, right? Political messages. Um, so that's one way. Sometimes through street art. They'll design something that looks cool, but it also means something, right? Mostly street art using these kind of things, but uh, an art that we use to see like painters like Mona Lisa and Scream and that kind of painters not using political issues, I think. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of religious scenes in paint. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so even though, I mean, there, there's different types of messages you can deliver, right? Religious, social, political, mm -hmm. um, there's tons. So um, it's, I think it's, it's more rare for art to not have a message than it is for it to have a message. Ken, oh. uh, hi Ken. Hi, hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Um, so how might an artist or an author use their work to deliver a message? Uh, uh, yeah, some artists, uh, you know, uh, intentionally, you know, bring the message to his artworks, but some are, some, some not, uh, some others maybe uh, are not. But uh, kind of, not a kind of political social message, but I think most of the work piece has some kind of message or, or the author's or artist's intention of mm -hmm. a feeling or emotion or something. Yeah. And, um... Uh, intention is rocky ground, right? Do you know what I mean by that? Rocky intention ground? Mm -hmm. is, I'll type it. Intention is rocky ground. It means it's, um, it's a s difficult to discuss a th author, an author's intention because we never really know what they meant mm, right. to do or to write. Um, yeah. Same with art, but we can still interpret it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, and so, sometimes maybe also themselves uh, don't know <laughs> where this uh, uh, art piece work for. Yeah, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That's a good point. A lot of the time they actually have no idea. Right? If you were to ask them, what does this mean, they just say, well, what do you think it means? <laughs> the whole point was just to get you to think something. Yeah, for sure. Um, can you think of an example of a painting or a book or something with a lot of meaning, like political, social? Yeah, one a Korea example is uh, John Lennon's Imagine. You know, the, before the Imagine, John Lennon, uh, you know, wrote a lot of direct social political message song, but mm -hmm. it doesn't uh, didn't appeal to not so many people. So he said uh, he said in the interview he changed the the his artwork uh, the kind of he he said he sugarcoated his political mess or social message into the very simple, beautiful words. That's uh, Imagine. Yeah. Does everyone know what it means, sugarcoated? No. To sugarcoat something, um, really common expression. Um, actually, Ken, why don't you tell us, what does it mean that he sugarcoated things? Like, you know, uh, when I was a child, uh, my mother, uh, you know, I, I, I really hate, uh, you know, kind of uh, some type of medicine because it's doesn't taste like, like it doesn't taste good. So my sometimes my mother uh, spread the sugar on on the on the medicine. Then I I can swallow it. That's mm -hmm. such a bitter medicine. <laughs> exactly. So that's the literal meaning, right? To mm -hmm. actually coat something in sugar to make it taste better. So then yes. we use that figuratively, right? So like you said, John Lennon sugar coated his lyrics um, mm -hmm. to disguise his political messages. So you, if you're sugarcoating something, you're trying to make it look more appealing or sweeter and nicer to an audience right. when really there's something else going on underneath it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty common one. So, um, Yeah, good. Um, hi, Servet. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Very good. Good, good. How are things there? Okay. Oh, you know, waking up, drinking coffee. Yes. <laughs> um, so how might an artist or an author use their work to deliver a message? We talked a bit so far, but what do you think, Servette? Yeah, art is all about delivering a message mm -hmm. and making some bugs also. Mm -hmm. And I can give an example of a girl who painted her house's walls to support the protest in Turkey. This event happened in the United States, yes. And mm -hmm. I read an article about it in one of these classes. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of delivering politic or any kind of message, sometimes about environment, sometimes it is about love, sometimes about politics. Can I'm just writing that? down the types of messages. We've we've talked about environmental, political, romantic, social, right? Mm -hmm. Religious. There's all sorts of different messages that some that you can deliver through art, or like uh, Ken kind of mentioned, sometimes they don't even really know what the message is. Yes. They're just like hoping you guys will find something <laughs> from it. Um, hey, Broken, are you awake? <laughs> yeah, partially. <laughs> I won't ask you any more questions for a while. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> um, sorry. Are you asking question or no? No, but you can. Do you have an answer for the question? I can ask it if you want. Okay, I kind of have an answer. Okay. Okay, I think maybe poems. Uh, almost all poems uh, have some kind of message, like "Oh, captain, my captain." <laughs> You're not sporting, and uh, like. Some art pieces have might have some kind of messages, but some of them just don't have. For example, Guernica has some kind of message, but also it has. In, he was inspired by the political events, 
So he had to explain why he drew that for the people who don't know the background story. Mm -hmm. So we might not understand immediately why he did this, but the background story might help. Yeah, for sure. Um, hi, Victor. Welcome, Victor. Hello, sir. How are you? Uh, I'm good, thanks. So um, we were just talking about art and messages. How do you think um, an artist or an author might use their work to deliver a message of some sort? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. So why do you think people try, or how do you, do people deliver messages through their artwork? Uh, I don't know, it's a difficult question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think... Uh, Or can you think of an example of some art or a book that has a message in it? I think every art has messages in it, but uh, sometimes it's hard to see the message. Mm -hmm. So maybe they uh, they might want to explain it in some kind of magazine or book. <laughs> I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. So many people can understand their meaning. All right. Okay, cool. Um, well, let's take a look at our pronunciation point. So we're talking about um, dropping the H when we say pro we use pronouns. He, his, him himself, her, herself. Any pronouns that start with an H, even though technically it's a pronounced H, we drop the H um, when we're speaking most of the time. This allows the pronoun to blend with the word that's coming before it. Um, so for example, is he going to work tomorrow turns into is he going to work tomorrow? Is he going to work tomorrow? And we drop the H. Or are you going to invite her? Instead of are you going to invite her? We drop the H to blend it to the word before. Are you going to invite her? Um, this last time, but here's our tongue twister. Um, I should see if I can find another H tongue twister. Here's one. Um, oops. When you read this sentence in two ways, I heard that you always speak like this when you say it her distinctly. You don't say no. this. No, no. Um, that when you're saying it distinctly, it's be, it's when it's the first word in a sentence, right? Yes. Like, her hair is black <laughs> or um, her picture is pretty or something um, but as soon as it's blended into a sentence the H disappears so um, is uh, are you going to invite her are you going to invite her um, fuzzy wuzzy was a bear fuzzy wuzzy had no hair fuzzy wuzzy wasn't very fuzzy was he so when you're reading it um, I, I exaggerated the H's intentionally and each of the ones that I exaggerated, we would actually drop. Butter half, well, butter half left hand doesn't really hurt. It's hard to say. Here, um, so maybe Servat, can you do the fuzzy wuzzy? <laughs> yes. Uh, should I also drop the edge in hat? Because hat. Fuzzy wuzzy add no. Has perfect tense. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't very fuzzy. Wuzzy. <laughs> very good. Ken, do you want to try it? Okay. 
Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't very fuzzy, was he? Wuzzy. Wuzzy. Louisa? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't very fuzzy, was he? Wuzzy. <laughs> um, Birkin, do you want to try the next one? I I just made one up underneath. Okay. She told him it was funny because he wasn't himself that day. <laughs> heard a lot of H's. <laughs> so it should be. She told him he was funny because he wasn't himself that day. All your H's should drop on him, he, he, and himself. She told him he was funny because he wasn't himself. Okay, is that what she sounds like? It's like a message. <laughs> um, Victor, do you want to try this one? And try dropping your H's. Okay. Um, Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't very fuzzy, was he? Wuzzy, wuzzy, good. Um, does anyone else want to try this second one? Maybe Servette? Yes. I won't drop the edges that are in the beginning question, like he was funny even though it's a continuation. She told him he, he was you in, you could drop it or you could you could pronounce it. She told him he because it could sound like this. She told him he probably was funny. It could sound like this. She told him he was funny. Mm, okay. It depends on how... The, the more quickly you say it, the more your H's disappear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She told him he was funny because he wasn't himself that day. Good. She told him he was funny because he wasn't himself that day. Good. Ken, do you want to try that one? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, she told him he was funny he, because he was like, himself that day. Okay. Don't forget to drop your H's. Uh. Because he wasn't. Because he wasn't. <laughs> Sounds like because he was. <laughs> because he was. Because he was. Because he was. <laughs> Good. So okay. So just to show you that we drop our H's off of um, off of our pronouns, unless it's at the beginning of a sentence, and then we pronounce them always. Um, and yeah, Servette, Sometimes you'll still pronounce them. It's just that the more quickly you talk, the more they disappear. <laughs> so it depends on what speed you're going at. Yeah. How about intonation? To when we learn everything, to what should we do to distinguish? To to dis to make it stand out. Uh, like in the sentence, there are two sentences, and she told them he was funny. It looks a bit vague to understand the second sentence. There's a second sentence. Or mm -hmm. where, where, where does it start? She told him he, he was funny because... He showed him he was funny or he was funny. Should we... Yeah, so it would... The page like it. This. I'm just going to type it with capital letters on where you would emphasize, okay? Kind of like this. She told him he was funny because he wasn't himself that day. That's where the emphasis would be. Oh, okay. Okay. And I tried to get rid of the H's. <laughs> but um, like I said, you, you might still pronounce your H on that first he. Mm -hmm. It depends on how how you're yes. how quickly you're speaking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um Okay, let's take a look at future questions. Sorry for the review, guys. If it's new, or um, if it's a review. Um, so, how to form future questions with will? Um, 
Ken, would you like to read this part for us? Okay. How to form future corrections with will? Will plus subject. I see job plus verb plus optional time phrase plus a question. Will you go to work tomorrow? Will you send an email? Good. And then we have going to, which is formed sim in a similar way. Um, Louisa? Yeah. How to form future corrections uh, with going to? N is R plus subject plus verb plus optional time phrase plus what? Question mark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are they going to go to the party this weekend? Mom, I'm going to get a ki kitten. Good. Am I, go am I going to get a kitten? What is kitten? A kitten is a baby cat. Am I going to get a kitten? Okay, so that's how we form it. Will, your subject, your verb, or am, is, are, so to be, your subject, and your verb. We also use the future continuous, um, most often, actually, in speech when we're asking questions. Um, Victor? I can open the screen. Wait a second. Okay, okay. You see it? Uh, um, okay. Mm -hmm. How to form future question with going to? Am um, is a uh, plus objective plus verb, uh, optional time phrase, plus question mark. Are they going to go to the party this weekend? Mom, am I going to get a kitten? Perfect. For this one, um, using the present continuous, are Jenny and May buying groceries? Is Luke driving to university tomorrow? So we some we often use the future or the present continuous. Oops, to ask questions as well. Most often we use the present continuous. Um, for the difference between will, ah, uh, can, broken. It was about the documents. Oh, it, it wasn't working. No, I was going to say, could you change look to someone else? I feel like we are in Star Wars. <laughs> Is it better? <laughs> Okay. Going to or will um, for choosing between them. So when we want to talk about future facts or things we believe to be true, we use will. The president will serve for four years, so future facts. Um, if you're not so certain, certain, you can add probably, possibly, I think. Um, I hope you'll visit me in my home one day. So not so certain about a future fact. If you're making a prediction based on evidence in the present situation, you use going to. Not a cloud in the sky. It's going to be another warm day. And how do we shorten going to? Gonna. 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 So it's going to be another warm day. Good. Um, so making a prediction based on what's going on. The traffic is terrible. We're going to miss our flight. Um, at the moment of making your decision, you use will. Once you've made the decision, you talk about it with going to. So I will. I'll call Jenny to let her know. Sarah, I need Jenny's number. I'm going to call her. So while you're making the decision, it's will. And once you've made it, you use going to to discuss it. So those are some of the differences. And then present continuous can pretty much replace either of them whenever. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. If you are talking with your friend and you say like I'm going to do something, uh, and when will they think like you are serious about it because you use going to instead of will? Mm, probably not. But if you tell oh your friend you're gonna do something, I think they'll assume that you you intend to do it. Like, when you use going to, they would think, like, oh, my God, he's serious. No. Like, um, I 
they mean the exact same thing. It's not like if you said this, I'd be like, oh, man, he's really <laughs> going to call me. You know? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, no, it, it, no, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> no. Uh, any other questions? Okay, let's take a look at our article. Oh, it's going to be really small this time. But I gave you the link. Sorry about the font. I thought it would zoom in. <laughs> oh, there's a slideshow. Oh, it's an EXP file. <laughs> stop no. the download. We could stop. Okay. Um. So, avant-garde. Uh, do, have you guys heard of this word before? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. In French, it means front guard, advance guard, or vanguard. People often use the term in French and English to refer to people or works. <laughs> that are experimental or novel, particularly with respect to art, culture, and politics. According to its champions, the avant-garde pushes the boundaries of what is accepted as the norm within definitions of art, culture, and reality. The origin of the application of this French term to art can be fixed at May 17, 1863. Um, I'm just gonna can go down here. To this part. The vanguard, a small troop of highly skilled soldiers, explores the terrain ahead of a large advancing army and plots a course for the army to follow. This, this concept is applied to the work done by small bands of intellectuals and artists as they open pathways through new cultural or political terrain for society to follow. Due to implied meanings stemming from the military terminology, some people feel the avant-garde implies elitism especially when used to describe cultural movements. The term may also refer to the promo promotion of radical social reforms, the aims of its various movements presented in public declarations called manifestos. Over time, avant-garde became associated with movements concerned with art for art's sake, focusing primarily on expanding the frontiers of aesthetic experience rather than with wider social reform. In our context, the avant-garde will cover the avant-gardist movements of the early 20th century um, that specifically focused on visual communication design and or implemented it as a modus operandi. So um, there's a few pictures from Malovic. Have you guys heard of have Malovic? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. So there's a few paintings here, a few more. Bits of constructivism. Here's, oh, I don't know how to say it, Lisitsky. Some other pieces of work. The story of the little red square. <laughs> it's a book. Mm -hmm. and then they go on to show us some more stuff. This looks like um, propaganda. And I don't know what it, I don't know what it says. <laughs> About book, the belly. Um, mm -hmm. Here's some more. Futurism. So this is all postmodernism or avant-garde painting. Here's Dadaism. So let's go back um, just to this part. I know it's kind of small, but do you guys see any vocabulary that you would like to focus on? Any new words? Uh, a modus Oper, operandi, what is it? Um, oh. The last word of the second paragraph. Um, I don't know how it's, it's not, I think it's Latin. A particular <laughs> way or method of doing something. The way mm. something works, the procedure. An MO, yeah, exactly. Okay. Any other new words in here? Retrain in the beginning of second paragraph. Explore the terrain. Terrain, yes. 
Oh, we've got it twice actually. Explores the terrain ahead and then they mention again new cultural or political terrain. Um, terrain is basically just ground. Um, so if we're, let's see, you can see me. We talk about the terrain as like a big area of land, different types of ground. So there might be a rocky terrain, there might be a wet terrain, a flat terrain, bumpy, right? So it's just a different way to say the area of ground. Um, that's how we use it literally. In this case, they're talking about the figurative terrain, right? Exploring the terrain, exploring the road ahead, figuratively. So actually, it was normal terrain because they were talking about army. Not for oh, for this one, it's normal terrain. For this one, it's it's figurative. Mm -hmm. So they've used it to actually physically talk about the terrain. <laughs> and mm. then down here, they're using it to say the political terrain or the political ground. Right? Yes. Um, any other words? We've got some strange ones. Can I ask something? Sure. So is it uh, basically means doing something that doesn't been done? Like yep. doing the frontier job? Mm -hmm. What else did you guys gather from this? I, know, I read it a bit quickly and there's lots of crazy words in here. So did you understand what exactly this is? Um, mm -hmm. So so far, Firkin said it's like doing something that hasn't been done. How else would could we describe this movement? Go west. Sorry. Go west. Go west. Uh, kind of, you know, the in, in the in a uh, long time ago, American people believed that. You know, move go west to search for the oh, new thing. Oh right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, um, exploring the new the new frontier. Mm -hmm. Right. That whole th yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it says it's art for art's sake. So does it mean doesn't it doesn't have any message at all? Yeah, that's what that means. So art for art's sake. It means we're just painting for the sake of painting. Just and what about those propagandas? Right. So this is what it's saying. Over time, avant-garde, um, it's also called postmodernism. That's why I just have been saying both. Um, became associated with movements concerned with art for art's sake, focusing primarily on expanding the frontiers of aesthetic experience rather than with wider social reform. So it's saying that it became associated with that, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what was going on. It means that critics and viewers and people interested in this or um, discussing, debating the art form started to kind of group it into a mold of artists who just painted just cuz, saying that it didn't have much meaning to it. Um, but I would argue if you talk to one of these painters they would tell you different. So. It's just I have a thing. one more question. Yeah. Who is the most famous artist of avant-garde? Mm, I don't know. He's he's one of them, Malovic. Malovic. But I'm not I'm not sure. We can let me find. I'll find you a list. It is called like icon of avant-garde. Mm -mm. Let's see. Jackson Pollock. Mm. Here I found it. Long. Oops. Put it over here. There's a list. Um, let's see, which ones do we know of? Gauguin? Did you, have you guys heard of him? Yeah. Henri Matisse? Um, there's Malovic. O'Keefe. Ah, 
Yoko Ono. <laughs> Picasso, Jackson Pollock, um, Andy Warhol. I don't know if I would say Andy Warhol was avant-garde, but that's okay. Um, Frank There's Stella. There's Picasso, and you didn't choose him. I did. I said Picasso. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um... There's architects, yeah. So to get an idea. Um, any other questions, or does everyone understand the what the movement was about? It's a few words. What does elitism mean? Oh, the high crust. Yeah, elite. The elite is like the high class, right? Elitism. What's a manifesto? Uh, kind of. A statement is used, uh, sometimes is used by the political party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like the Communist Manifesto, for example, is one of the, it's titled that, it's one of the popular ones. Um, aesthetic experience, what does that mean? Uh, concerned about beauty. Yeah, concerned about appearance, beauty. Um, okay, let's talk about it. So, put, your shoes, put yourself in the shoes of an avant-garde or political artist. What would you try to prove with your work? So basically what they were trying to do was shatter the norms of art, make things different, unique, new, um, and they were, at the same time, they were making a lot of political statements with their work. So if you were, you know, in this time, or if right now you became this sort of artist, is there a certain message that you would want to convey, like pol politically or socially? Um, Ken? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Take a minute to think. This is a pretty deep question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I actually, so I, it's not a message, but you know, uh, when I was in America, I, I sometimes I miss Japan, and but uh, I walk. Uh, uh, one day I walking down the campus. When I was was walking down the campus, it, 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 uh, I see the sky, and the sky sky was same as Japan, so mm -hmm. I notice, I realize, oh, we we are. People are all people in the world are living in the same under the same sky, kind of. So I feel such kind of feeling. So I want to express such feeling. Uh, if I uh, yeah can uh, make uh, some art. So something about like equality and how we're all on the same planet, right? Mm -hmm. Right. We're all in this together. Have you heard some people um, talk about the moon? how we're all looking at the same moon at night. There's um, a, a poem about that, but I couldn't tell you who wrote it. <laughs> it's interesting. OK. Um, how would you express it, Ken? Would you just paint a sky? What do you think you would do to express it? Oh, maybe paint the paint sky. And actually, uh, I remember when I was a child, I bought a, a blue sky with clouds. And and I wrote one Chinese character. Japanese use Japanese use Chinese character as well, which means mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be <laughs> that, that uh, 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 such kind of art of oh, okay. piece of art. So have like <laughs> a sky with some characters in it, like yeah. one in the middle or something. That mm -hmm. sounds cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and you've typed a little bit, so what about you? Can you explain? Okay. I'm saying that, for example, uh, if a person goes to another place, uh, probably that person will uh, experience some kind of alienation, even though not in high levels, but probably he will. And those people might go extreme and say, like, you're not one of us. And when you do that to other people, uh, you're becoming like completely indifferent to the other people and so when you are going to their country and invade them you won't be that caring that much so I'm saying that uh, if you 
don't um, remove the borders between people in the world, uh, wars won't end. Borders is a huge subject in um, art, writing. Um, Ken, it's you, you're working on your degree, right, Ken? Mm -hmm. You must you must have read lots about borders. <laughs> uh, yes. It always comes up, right? In mm -hmm. theory and in in the whole art and literary world, borders is like a huge theme. So Fergan would do something about kind of breaking down borders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um what about you, Servette? Is there a message that you would try to prove or um talk about in your work if you made something? I would probably touch on segregation stemming from a lot of different things like segregation. culture, race, religion, a lot mm -hmm. of different things. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, how would you do it? Do you think you would be a painter? You would write something? I would definitely be a painter. Maybe as an example, I would draw the wall maybe uh, in Germany, mm -hmm. just as an example, maybe, mm -hmm. or something like this. The wall. It's so cool. I love the Berlin Wall. <laughs> um, okay. Victor, what about you? If you pretend you're a avant-garde or a political artist, what are you going to prove with your work? Victor? I can't hear you. You might be muted. Okay, what about uh, Louisa? I don't know. I really don't know. I never think about it. So there are many things that I would love to speak about with paintings, but I'm not pretty sure how I should brought it and how to share it with others. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know if we lost Victor. <laughs> Victor Okay, um, you just asked the wall is cool or the message, and it just reminded me of one of, I was obsessed, like I didn't want to leave Berlin because I just loved the wall, um, but there was, there's one really famous picture on kissing. I know the one. What I'm talking about? Yeah, this one. Um, that's the actual picture, and then this is what it looks like on the Berlin wall. Um, and there was a gay couple walking by, and I took their picture of them kissing in front of it. <laughs> it was so cool. <laughs> it's like, this is awesome. <laughs> and I wanted to take one for myself, but that would have been kind of creepy, so I didn't. Um, but there's tons of messages and stuff embedded in that art, for sure. It's really cool. Um, and aesthetically, it's really cool, because it's just very colorful, and it's, it's crazy. Um, has anyone else been there? No. No. <laughs> to go. You have to go if you're ever in Germany. Um, yeah. Will you ever visit a museum full of postmodern art? So I showed you some examples um, of avant-garde postmodern art. Do you like this style? Um, what do you think? Uh, you you are referring to paintings of Malevich. Yeah, um, well, we we had actually a handful of different ones. So Malevich is one. So, yeah, let's maybe just look at his. So, for example, first of all, do you see any sort of message in these paintings? Do they seem, I can make it a bit bigger, abstract to you? Um, do you like this style? I think this kind of art looks very cool on the wall, but they are just art. For art. I don't art, see for, any... art for art's sake, right? Like what they said? Uh, I don't see any kind of message. It just looks cool on the wall. I would like to design my house with this kind of art. Right. So just it's this. like what the argument was that it's more aesthetically pleasing than anything else? Yes. Yeah. Louisa, you said I like black square? Yeah. Uh, you know, another yeah, thing. I do. Got, um, yeah, <laughs> Malavik, right? Yes. 
You like it? Yeah, but actually, I think it's, it's not... awful. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you like it? Not at all. It's like uh, when you see the original painting, it kind of have um, some uh, or oh, how I don't know how to say in English, but it's not only black color in it, but we can see only black color. Like shadows? There's shadows in it. Uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, so under uh, him, on, um, oh my, I can't explain. <laughs> okay, there's so it's not just a black square. There's like something happening inside that we can't really see in a picture. Yeah. Is Maybe. it? Oh, I don't like, know what that. Like this one, but more like you can can see in this picture that you're now looking. You can kind of see, well, not really, it's hard to, um, so you can't see it unless you're actually looking at it? Yeah, so at In, first when I listened about this painting, I just thought, oh my god, he just paints just like square and it's like on art, but when <laughs> I think about it, I just understand maybe there is something interesting, more, uh, more interesting than just this square. Mm-hmm. And there's other some other work. He has a uh, and red square and another color. Yeah, black and red square. <laughs> <laughs> so what about something like this? Looks a little bit more of a concrete image than just the geometry, right? <laughs> so yeah. some of them, some of them are more that. Um, Frickin, you said it looks like geometry class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this isn't your style? <laughs> <laughs> um, would you ever go to a museum, like a postmodern or an avant-garde museum? Full of them? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I haven't seen any of those, so I might be interested in the first time, but then, uh, just for the first time. Mm-hmm. Ken, what do you think of this? Yeah, I can enjoy uh, this kind of work, and mm -hmm. I, I, I can appreciate the kind of uh, cuteness, the beaut beautifulness. Or <laughs> and uh, I heard the reason why this, you know, uh, geometrical pattern uh, appears in the, in the art piece or even in the ancient building, mm -hmm. because you know nature doesn't have this kind of artificial pattern, so human might have been attracted by this this kind of uh, artificial mm -hmm. kind of maybe uh, even the Asian people saw oh it's cool this part right. is cool oh, yeah. so mm -hmm. I think and I'm um, now I'm, I'm very familiar with watching this kind of art so uh, it's not so sensational for me but uh, I like it yeah it's kind of good picture <laughs> yeah <laughs> because it's, not so, it's not so groomy or yeah some picture might be groomy, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I like pop yeah, art. Actually. It's not really sensational anymore, is it? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> it was at the time, <laughs> but it's been a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, pop kind of falls into this category a little bit, like Lichtenstein and um, Andy Warhol. A little bit different. Oh my gosh, look at this. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't like artificial. So, we, we've had this, I, I think I already know your opinion on this, we've had it before. But, so you really only like, or mostly like art that's depicting something more realistic, right? Mm-hmm. Why is it just that you you don't really like the other style, or is there a reason? Not always, but I like nature. And, uh, when they depict it, there are too many details. But when you do it on painting, like without any, without looking at anything, or without trying to imitate anything, it might not be that impactful for me because. The nature is full of details, but your mind might not be have like that. And when you 
put it into a picture, it won't be that attractive to my mind, at least to my eyes. It does, it's not pleasing that much. Of course, not every kind of, for example, Salvador Dali's are really different and interesting, but I can say the same thing for this part, it's like a bunch of squares and uh, triangles. It's like this. I can't say that. I like it that much. So it has to be representing something a little bit more clearly, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are you guys ever going to create some sort of art? Is anyone in this class an artist or a writer? Does anyone write poetry, stories, paint? Me? I don't paint. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa, uh, do you do any sort of art, or will you, do you think you'll ever pick up in some sort of art? You you draw, don't you? Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm not good in it, <laughs> so it's just for fun. Mm -hmm. Um, for can we, Sorry, Louisa. I just like to watch art that means same people. <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't have to have an art and literature degree. But you have one. Um, not art. Well, I took art classes, but um, but I can't paint or anything. <laughs> um, do no uh, painting case by um, Klimt. Gustav. Sorry. Do no painting case by Gustav Klimt. Um, can you type it? I'll I'll look it up. Yeah. He's like this and oh it's yeah, a, uh, it uh, has and triangles and yeah, it's this one. I think Vulcan will like it because he don't like. <laughs> um, let's find a. This is kind of a clear picture of it. Yeah, because uh, it's not avant-garde, but it has that kind of thing in it. I think. Maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you like this one, Frickin? <coughs> dying. <laughs> Does anyone, what do you guys think? So, this still has a lot of geometric shapes, but it's representing something real still, right? Right. It's, it's like a dream. <laughs> Someone's dream. Mm -hmm. It does look like but a dream. You can't say his face is like geometric shape. He is, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. There's no squares or circles. No, but um, Louisa thought you would like this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it does look kind of dream. Look at the because of the background, right? Yeah. It's like they're floating. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Let's do. So, I want to practice your future questions. So I'm going to give you a verb and I want you to make a will question for me first. Um, Frickin. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. Will you drink anything tonight? Will you drink anything tonight? Okay. Louisa? Coke. I'm sorry? Cook. 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 And drink? Yeah, so can you make a quest a will question with cook? Oh, sorry. It's okay. I will cook dinner today. Good. Or will you cook dinner today? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, can create. Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna create uh, the song. Okay. Create. Yep. Yeah. Or in a question, you would say, "Are you?" Are you gonna create song? Good. The song. And Servette. Join. Will you will you join a soccer team? Okay, will you join a soccer team? Okay. Um, so, do you guys have any questions for me about future questions, your H, or about the article? 
And uh, is there a difference between the I'm B going to and uh, you know B a plus gerund? Both mm -hmm. both uh, expression uh, express future, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of like I'll be. If I don't know how to explain it, if it's in the future like this, I'll be running, I'll be um, jogging, I'll be cooking. It's functioning as a verb, mm -hmm. not a gerund. I'll be back. <laughs> I don't know why I read that. Something like that. Yeah, in the future, I'll it's working be, as I'll a be. as a verb, Ken. Mm -hmm. Not as a gerund. Um, Cool. Well, I'm teaching the next class. We're playing a game. And then after that, we're going to look at used to and the Bermuda Triangle. Okay? Oh, nice. See you soon. Okay. Oh, Thank you very much. Thanks. See you soon. See you.